So this, this talk is going to be sort of a tale of two technologies, to paraphrase a famous British writer. And I think that's apropos because both of these are tools to support writers and writing in different ways. So one is a, a commercial technology that's become very popular in many places around the world. And the other is an experimental technology that I help develop for research and pedagogical purposes. Um, both of them, I think, are potentially uh, powerful, maybe even transformative in some ways. And in my work, they provided interesting opportunities in terms of both evaluation and assessment. Uh, so the first is a commercial writing support tool called Grammarly, which you see here. I don't know how many folks uh, in the UK will be familiar with it, but it's quite popular here in the US. Uh, my own university has a license that supplies it free to all students and faculty. And I, I use it personally. I found it very useful and interesting from a technology standpoint. Um, it detects and corrects spelling and grammar and usage errors. And it does quite a good job at it. It can find a lot of stuff. And it's pretty accurate in, in finding that stuff. And that's because it's built on state-of-the-art natural language processing and machine learning techniques that it performs on servers in the cloud. Um, and it's also very accessible. It works in many of the places that the digital spaces that people write nowadays. And also really interestingly from my point of view is that it operates synchronously. So it gives you feedback while you write. And so we have made the argument in a couple of, of the papers that we published on Grammarly that it and other tools like it constitute a unique genre of writing support technology that we have dubbed automated written corrective feedback or AWCF tools. And they're different from tools for automated writing evaluation or AWE by virtue of their greater accessibility their focus strictly on lower level issues and their synchronous delivery among other things. And they're also different from what we may think of as the prototypical grammar or spell checker, the one that comes with Microsoft Word, uh, which is technically known as MSNLP for Microsoft Natural Language Processing. And I'm gonna be referring to it by, uh, by that name uh, throughout the talk because we used it as kind of a benchmark in, in a couple of these evaluations. And, and MSNLP, like Grammarly, also uh, works synchronously, but it works on the basis of much simpler technologies. And one thing that many people don't know is that MSNLP was designed for L1 writers of English. And the things that um, L1 writers have trouble with, of course, differ from those of L2 writers. In L1 writing, the most frequent error type, according to some research, um, is missing comma after an introductory element or a vague pronoun reference. Whereas the Cambridge Learner Corpus shows us that the most frequent errors in second language writing are content word choice errors, preposition errors, determiner errors, and so on. So it matters whether tools for automated error uh, correction are designed with L1 writers or L2 writers or both in mind. Now, it turns out that no one has yet evaluated, or at least at the time we started this project, no one had yet evaluated Grammarly or MSNLP, for that matter, with regard to how well it finds errors of the sort that, that most affect L2 writers of English. Uh, so in this evaluation, which will be coming out in uh, the journal Language Learning and Technology in February, we compare Grammarly to MSNLP in terms of error detection performance. And we also decided to look at the timing of the delivery of the feedback because Grammarly delivers feedback synchronously, but not instantaneously. Um, there, there's often a delay in errors getting flagged because of the advanced uh, technologies that Grammarly relies on. So we decided to look at that too. And so the first study was based on a corpus of writing from students taking our English placement test at, at Iowa State. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk about the methodology here because we just don't have time. But if people want to ask a, questions about that later, I'm happy to answer. Um, so, but we had, the, we had a, a small corpus of um, uh, texts from the, the, our English placement test that we ran through both Grammarly and MSNLP. 
And as you can see uh, down here in the totals, Grammarly flagged about 850 features corresponding to items in our list of common L2 errors compared to only 81 flaggings in the case of MSNLP. So in other words, more than 10 times as many flaggings. And these, uh, these flaggings constituted most of what Grammarly found. 60 plus percent were among these error types relevant to L2 writers compared to MSNLP, whose flaggings in these categories were a mere 10% uh, of its total. And then in terms of the accuracy of the feedback, Grammarly's overall precision rate was 0.84, which means in 84% of cases, its identification and labeling of a certain type of error was attested by our, our human annotators. And in 81% of cases, the correction that it suggested was deemed appropriate. Uh, by comparison, MSNLP actually had a slightly higher precision and a slightly lower correction rate. But of course, this is for a much smaller set of uh, items found. And these are features that require comparatively simple detection methods like uh, subject verb agreement. As regards the timing of the feedback in the second study in this evaluation, we had 20 students, uh, 20 student writers write two short essays, one in each feedback condition. And um, we found big contrasts, as you can see here. So most of the feedback from Grammarly was indeed provided after a delay. Just about 20% appeared at the point of inscription, but the rest occurred earlier in the, excuse me, <coughs> in the text. Compared to MSNLP, where almost 90% of the flaggings appeared almost instantaneously uh, right where the cursor was, right where the, the, the writer was inputting text. And this again is because the checks that MSNL, NS, MSNLP performs are, are much simpler and they're performed uh, on the user's local machine as opposed to remote servers. So um, we limited our further analysis of precise timings to just the Grammarly data, which you see here, and we found a significant difference between the average p-burst length, and p-burst stands for pause burst. So this is uh, this is a, a burst of writing that's um, uh, bordered by by a pause. And what it is, it's a it's a putative measure of the current contents of verbal working memory um, that we obtained from keystroke data. Um, so there was a delay, um, a significant delay between the average uh, p-burst length and the average delay in Grammarly's flagging of an error following completion of the typing of that error. So in other words, most of the time what's getting flagged by Grammarly is something that doesn't correspond to what the writer currently has in their head and are trying to formulate into words on the computer. And so we postulate that this uh, constitutes a potential distraction, potential undermining of the process of formulation or, or transcription by visually prompting the writer to switch to revision at what may very well be an inopportune time. They're trying to put an idea into words and Grammarly is drawing their attention to a different idea and di different words. And in a follow-on study that we're working on now, uh, we, we've included perception measure measures to see if writers actually experience these discrepancies in timing as distractions. So that was one evaluation that we did focusing on Grammarly's feedback. And another that's under review now and that we presented at the, the uh, AAA, AAAL conference in 2019, looked at the other side of the coin. And that is the revisions that students make while using an AWCF tool. And we're interested in how synchronous feedback affects students' revision behavior, and importantly, the distribution of revisions that are prompted by the tool in relation to those that are initiated by writers themselves. And that's important because AWCF tools only address issues of form, spelling, grammar, and usage, whereas writers, we know, will revise for those sorts of things, but also higher level concerns like content organization, how well you know, I've, I've fulfilled the, the task requirements and so on. And so to the extent that a, a synchronous feedback tool like Grammarly is flagging a lot of useful things, one can ask how much it's changing the way second language writers normally do things. Research shows they usually spend the initial stages of a writing task 
engaged in planning and formulating, and they leave revising for later. And so we wanted to know, does Grammarly cause them to switch that up at all? And so uh, you see our, um, th this is our uh, um, research question. How does choice of synchronous AWCF tool influence the frequency of revisions, both writer and tool initiated in general and at different stages of the composition process? Um, and so what you see here are the frequencies of uh, both types of revision. So writer initiated in red and those initiated by the tool, Grammarly or MS NLP in blue, across uh, three stages of writing. So initial, uh, middle, and final. And here all we did was we just took the total writing time and divided into three equal parts and then counted up the revisions in each of those parts. Um, and in cases where students were using uh, Grammarly, uh, our analysis, we use mixed effects modeling, showed that for tool initiated revisions, there were uh, significantly more of them, as you can see here. And uh, as you'd expect, based on the other study that I told you about, um, compared to MSNLP, where the frequencies of tool initiated revisions were not significantly different across stages of writing. And that makes sense because Grammarly, as we said, finds more stuff. And as the text gets longer, there's more potential stuff to find. But uh, more interestingly, with respect to the writer initiated revisions in red, and keep in mind, uh, this includes revisions for things like content, okay, which are, which are potentially more substantive. On the MSNLP side, we found uh, significant increases in the frequency of writer initiated revisions uh, as writing progressed in, across the stages of writing, which is in line with, with uh, existing research. But in the Grammarly condition, this was not the case. So essentially, the amount, the amount of writer-initiated revisions remained unchanged. And so our interpretation is that these student writers were kind of giving up more responsibility for identifying errors to the tool in the case of Grammarly. Uh, and I suppose a stronger interpretation would be that um, Grammarly is having a sort of a suppressing effect on writer initiated revisions. And if we think about cognitive models of writing, that, that makes sense given that second language writers are already prone to focus on local concerns and they can conserve cognitive load, they can conserve mental energy by letting Grammarly do the work of identifying errors for them. But to the extent they're spending more time attending to Grammarly's feedback, that may be time taken away from uh, doing their own evaluation and enacting their own revisions. So the takeaways here uh, from these Grammarly evaluations are on the plus side that L2 student writers stand to benefit from using AWCF tools because of their enhanced abilities to find and correct errors that these students typically have problems with. But on the negative side, there's need for caution when it comes to synchronous use of such tools because of the potential for distraction and for undermining students' normal process engagement, including the need to be doing their own more substantive evaluation and revision of their work. So that's some of my recent work evaluating technologies for supporting L2 writing. And I want to move on now to some more assessment oriented work and to that second technology that I mentioned. Uh, so this is a tool that's been developed at Iowa State University where I work. And the computer scientist um, behind this innovation is my colleague, um, Evgeny Chukarev Hudilainen. And uh, this tool is called SciRite. So it's named after ISU's mascot, uh, Sci. And SciRite has actually served as a test bed for several different research projects but the one I want to share involved tools for tracing students' writing processes using keystroke logging and eye tracking. And that's what's represented here in this um, screen capture footage. Uh, now, processes have not figured much in L2 writing assessment research, um, at least until very recently. And that's because the, the historically predominant form in the field has been the impromptu timed essay, which if you think about it, kind of renders um, 
recursiveness and extensive revision, you know, these sort of sorts of hallmarks of skilled writing, uh, it renders those things moot. You just don't have the opportunity to do them in a 30 minute uh, uh, timed essay task. Um, that said, there have been many calls to capture process information in writing assessments and thus expand the construct. And recently, some large scale standardized assessments have experimented with keystroke logging, at least here in the US. Meanwhile, the folks who study writing processes have been experimenting with different ways of uh, visualizing process data. And this is necessary because of these huge data sets that are generated by these methods. You just can't make, try to make sense or find patterns in the raw numbers. And so the visualizations are, are really important. Um, and they, they could be used for uh, pedagogical purposes, but with the exception of a pair of studies by um, Lindgren and Sullivan, at least up to this time when we, we started working on this project, there hadn't been much work done on using process tracing to support writing instruction. So we got a grant from the US National Science Foundation to see if process tracing could be made practical for classroom application and further to see if uh, process visualizations could be used for formative assessment or assessment for learning. Now back to the tool. So uh, what you see here is uh, called the post-session viewer. Um, what, what's not shown here is the editor what, that students actually worked in. That was just a very basic word processor that um, logged keystrokes. And under the computer monitor, there was a, a, an eye tracker, a, um, a kind of a, a consumer level, uh, low cost eye tracker mounted on the bottom of it. And the software that my colleague devised very cleverly integrated the two. And after each writing session, um, it would produce the sort of visualization that you see here. Um, and the two components of the viewer are the process graph um, at the top and then the, uh, the playback area down below. And there, there are controls for playback up here. Um, and the graph shows time in minutes um, on the x-axis and then number, uh, might be hard to see, but uh, the uh, number of characters on the y-axis. And these colored lines here depict um, five variables of interest. So blue is what we call the process line. And this was the total number of characters typed. And then green was the product line. So this was the total number of characters minus those that were um, deleted or backspaced. So um, you can think of the difference between these two as a kind of a crude measure of revision. And then red indicates cursor position. Yellow is eye fixation. And pink is scrolling because um, as the text gets longer, less of it uh, fits on the screen here in playback. And I can show you a live view of this. OK, so I'll just uh, uh, start it and you can see it in motion. Um, now, although it uh, resembles screen capture, it's actually a recreation. What you're looking at is a recreation of the develop development of the text that's generated from the computer logs. And that's this yellow dot uh, represents eye fixation. And um, I think one of our uh, really, one, one of our real innovations in this design was to link these two dynamically. So you can see as I move around in the playhead up at the top, you can see what was happening on the editing surface at any uh, particular point in time. And that gives us, that affords us this kind of simultaneous macro and micro level perspective on process. And uh, to aid interpretation, it's helpful to think about things in the graph, kind of mirroring things in playback. So as the text gets longer, things in the graph go higher. And conversely, if you're moving back up into previously written text, that's represented as downward movement in the graph. So this red, uh, let me find a better example. Um, all of this red below green here represents um, some sort of revision. And I, I should also note that we, what we did here uh, was we positioned the prompt, the instructions at the prompt at the top of the file where students were working 
um, so that, uh, th and this was how we uh, operationalized the process of defining the task. So, so if people were going back up to um, re-read -re or reread the prompt, we, uh, we called that task definition. And then we also instructed the participants to do all their planning in the file so that we could capture um, their planning processes, at least their external uh, planning. Um, and in this particular paper, uh, back to my slides here, and in this particular paper, which was published in Assessing Writing in 2018, which we co-authored with our uh, graduate assistant, Hui Shen Feng, we had two case study participants, uh, Zedong and Mingyu, who were similar in age, uh, both first year international students, both Mandarin L1 speakers, both studying computers. And Zedong, the male student, was assessed as having lower English proficiency and was enrolled in a lower level, in the lower level writing course. Um, and as, as before, I'll be happy to, to, to summarize the methods later if anyone's interested. But uh, just jumping to the findings, our first major finding was that the process data made it possible to position the participants with respect to developmental models of writing. So this is uh, Zedong's graph for the one and only writing session he did for the first of the four writing tasks in the study. And you can see he spent about an hour and a half on it, 90 minutes. And um, he spends the, uh, what the data show is, is basically a, a very linear approach to composing. He spends the first 10 minutes uh, reading and rereading the prompt and trying to formulate the first uh, few sentences of his response. Um, if you look in the playback, there's no um, externalized planning. He just basically jumps right into formulation at an early point. And there's also no recursivity. So he keeps producing ideas one after the other until he reaches basically the word count requirement and then he stops. And the only backward movement you can see uh, are these little red spikes here where basically he's just going up one or two lines to, to create, to, to uh, enact a, a minor revision in a previous sentence. And then in terms of an actual revision stage at the end, uh, this is all you get here, this little spike of about a, you know, a minute or two where he, he went back up to the previous, to the, to the initial, uh, the first paragraph and uh, made a couple of um, minor uh, word choice changes. Uh, these are the developmental models that I'm referring to. So the, the knowledge telling model here represents um, the novice approach where writing is this simple linear act of retrieving information from memory and, and sort of telling what you know. Whereas more skilled, uh, skilled writers uh, will uh, exhibit knowledge transforming, which is where the writer uh, exhibits, sorry, um, uh, develops a, a mental representation of the text that's separate from the context and that's uh, the content and that's based on rhetorical or communicative goals. And so writing uh, becomes a, a form of problem solving where the writer's trying to align that desired content with those intended rhetorical and communicative purposes. And of course, a hallmark of this approach is recursiveness. Uh, so there's more advanced planning, there's more modification of plans while writing, there's more extensive revision of the initial drafts. And uh, it's important to note that Bereiter and Scardamalia, who proposed these models, say that you can't tell where writers are in their development just by looking at written products, because writing outcomes are affected by you know, knowledge of task, knowledge of topic, genre knowledge, and language proficiency, of course. So you have to look at the cognitive processes of writing and how they're enacted. And so with the help of process tracing, we were able to position uh, Zedong closer to the knowledge telling side of things. And, and this can inform instruction. Uh, by contrast, uh, Mingyu was clearly closer to the knowledge transforming side of things. So she divided up her work on the first task over two sessions, the first one lasting about 75 minutes and the second one about 12 minutes. And if we look at uh, the playback, we can see some pretty stark differences with Zedong's approach. So Mingyu, I'll just uh, kind of um, uh, cycle through some of the, the, begin the beginning parts here so you can see, this is her um, 
uh, working on her initial plan. So she spent about uh, 13 minutes uh, um, uh, developing a, a plan before she started to, to write. She's generating ideas, organizing her ideas before she starts to formulate the text proper. And um, you can see she also engages in uh, what we could call em em emergent planning. She's doing a lot of um, sort of stopping formulating and then moving, you can see here, uh, moving back up to um, the part of the file where she's got her plan to update that plan with new ideas that have come to her while writing. And then she will continue formulating or revising on the basis of that adapted plan, that updated plan. And so there's a lot of recursivity happening here. Um, and then she also has a, a devoted stage to, um, to revision, uh, evaluation and revision here in the second session, where she basically goes through the entire text. Okay, So you can see um, you know, the product line is up here. This is the finished text. And then she's way back up at the top. And she's uh, um, reading and, and making changes all the way through. Most of these are, are sentence level changes, but there are also some more global higher order changes. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my timer here. So in, in the interest of time, I will just briefly summarize the second major finding, which was that process tracing supports uh, diagnosis and attempts to address issues with process engagement. So in Zedong's case, we um, identified some inefficiencies in, in the way he was formulating, some disfluencies in his process, which is uh, depicted here in this graph from his first session. All of these gaps uh, indicate, uh, they, they represent disfluencies. So we had him practice, we gave him some helpful strategies for this and, and help, uh, had him practice. And then by the fourth and final task, you can see um, he's formulating much more smoothly. And in Mingyu's case, it helped us diagnose a recurring problem she was having with what we called idios idiosyncratic task definition. In other words, going off topic. So um, she would just she would just stray uh, start straying from from the prompt, and this was evident by contrasting her task one data up here with uh, Zedong's down here. So in, in Zedong's case, all of this pink at the beginning represents um, him rereading, reading and rereading the prompt at the top of the file. Whereas you can see um, Mingyu um, is just, there's just these little downward spikes, um, very uh, kind of punctuated and um, uh, not, uh, there, there aren't many of them. Um, so she's, she's not spending that much time uh, reading and, uh, you know, perhaps thinking about uh, what, what's uh, expected of her. Um, so we came up with a plan to help her with that. So to summarize, uh, we found evidence for the idea that process tracing supports more meaningful assessment for learning, first by facilitating macro level diagnoses with reference to developmental models of writing, which we found to be immediately useful for informing instruction. Second, by facilitating formative assessment of specific process and strategy related problems. And then more generally, we, we argue in this paper that it allows for an expansion of the construct of writing in classroom assessment, while allowing practitioners to benefit more, to benefit more directly from the writing process literature. Uh, but in another publication, um, the, uh, a year later, uh, we, we go back and we point out some of the challenges to widespread adoption of process tracing such as making it practicable for instructors who already have uh, you know, a lot on their plate with respect to, to feedback on writing, as well as the need for students to develop self-assessment skills and the need for uh, classroom materials to support what we see as a, a, a new, truly data-driven form of process writing instruction. Um, and I hope that kind of sets up the uh, you know the discussion for for later where we're talking about benefits and, and challenges of new technologies for supporting writing, uh, but at that point I at this point I will stop.